Good afternoon and welcome to another EEAP broadcast. Today I'm here with, again as usual, Michael Crawley and I am Rick Roman. Um, we are going to be talking about heat illness today and uh, some of the changes that are taking place here effective, well, Michael, in a couple of days, isn't it? They are. They're going to come into place May 1st, and this is going to be a big thing for us out there. We've had a number of our clients wondering what they're going to do and how they've got this under control, and do we have their back on this, and we do. We've created a whole PowerPoint presentation to educate you today, but more importantly, we've got a free download that Rick has put together that will talk about all the things that your management needs to do in supervision, how to implement, some free posters that we put together so that we can help teach and educate and remind. And then we've got some lessons that we put in there for you on this download so that you, at the end of this you'll either have almost everything you need and uh, if not everything you need if you're a client of ours and we can make sure this works out well for you we don't get cited over this issue. All right, so let's get started here, Michael. So the, the so we're talking specifically about the heat illness changes. These are the the new 2015 changes that are taking place. And uh, go ahead, Michael. If you'll go ahead and advance the slide for me. I have been designated to advance the slide today, and I am taking that responsibility. Thank you, Rick. All right, Rick. definitions. All right. So they start off by making a, a change to the definition of what shade is. Now obviously we all know what shade is, but specifically in this requirement it talks about blockage of the sun and, and being sufficient uh, when, when it, uh, you're, you're not going to cast a shadow, um, for example, and also that you have some circulation of air. So for example, if you're sitting in your car, um, we all know that the cars tend to get a little hotter than it is even outside. And so, so that isn't sufficient. So you need a place that you can sit where you've got some air circulating and uh, some shade. But what they've added to it, and, and as we go through these slides, you'll see some of the text is in black, which is actually what was already in the code previously and continues to be in the code. The things that you will see that are in blue, those are the new elements that they've added. And you'll also see some words that are stricken because those are the parts that they've taken out. So in this part, they've added to the definition of shade that, right. that it does not deter or discourage the access of use, Michael. Well, let me say that is exactly what they've added to it because some of the job sites out there and of the shade areas on agriculture and other places, the shade is not something you want to go to. So we have created a couple pictures here. You can see the first one. Uh, there are some notes within the Calish Law that talk about they, the shade cannot be in muddy water or narrow to wet areas where the employees have to cross. And so if the shade is over a stream, I know that's probably not going to happen very much for you, but if it is that kind of discouragement where they don't want to go there and it's way, way out of the way, then the shade will not count. Another example that we see is that the shade, a beautiful shaded tree, it's right by the Andy Gumps, and uh, let me tell you, nobody wants to sit and take a deep breath by an Andy Gump. And so that is also being discouraged because the, in the code when it comes to some of the additional comments they made that we haven't put here because it just gets too much, Rick, and one of them says that you can't have them by all the porta potties. So you got to make sure these areas are truly something that doesn't discourage. Exactly. All right, well, let's go ahead and, and move on to the next slide here and the changes regarding the provision of water. Yes. So, uh, so one of the things they've added that now, and, and some of this is simply verbiage, uh, but it now says that it has to be fresh, pure, and suitably cool. Nice, Rick. And uh, it has to be provided to the employees free of charge. Correct. And it has to be located as close as practical to the areas where the employees are working. Let, let me work backwards on that for you guys. Uh, it's got to be as close as practically possible. So in past years when I've seen this in, in inspections, we've got water that is you know, a hundred yards away and these guys got to hike it over there. That's just not going to, that's not going to count anymore. As close as practically possible and every inspector that comes out is going to be a little bit different on that. And so you got to make sure you're really getting it as close as you possibly can. Now the next one that they're talking here is the provided by, the provided to employees free of charge. Some of the mindset of, the, of our companies and the people we ran into would say, well, they always have their water supply because I make, they can't start their job until they bring it from home. Or they have their own jugs uh, that they have, which is okay for them to bring, but then I tell them to fill their water at home and bring it. 
The code now says, provided to your employees free of charge. I'm not sure ever charging them for it was an idea of yours, but remember, it says provided to. And so as you go through this code, it's about the interpretation of that, and are you providing it if they're bringing it from home? Our goal, our statement now is that's going to be a no, but we've got to see how the district managers implement this as we go. But just to make sure, you should be providing them with that water before anything else. And then, yes, Rick. Well, I was going to say, and, and on, on keeping it as close to practically possible, sometimes people want to keep the, the water cooler under the shaded area or yeah. what have you. And, and due to access, you might have circumstances where um, the shaded area can't be as close, but you can bring the water bucket yes. a little closer. And, that, and that's what they're going to want you to do. Um, you know, if you've got guys working on three different floors of a high rise, it'd be a good idea to have a bucket on each floor. Yep, yep. I, I'm not bothered with that. When you say bucket, you're really talking about an igloo. Yes. Right? We're not talking about a bucket of water that you're spooning. No, no, Rick's got a twist of the tongue. The other one that comes up to is, is fresh, pure, and suitably cool. Let me tell you about fresh. I'm not sure exactly what fresh means, but let's say no floaties. Pure, I guess it's got to be clear looking. It can't be cloudy or stuff like that. And suitably cool, well, you and sir are just fresh out of luck. I'm not sure what that means besides cool. Uh, we've heard some guidelines and some of it, but really, if it's 110 outside, you know, 95 degree water might feel cool, but I'm not sure it's going to pass in a Cal Ocean inspection. So there is no code to say a degree. So just know that if it's something that you, as the management or owner or foreman, really wouldn't want to drink, then don't make your people drink it. Pour it on your hand and put it in a little bit in your mouth and see if it's cool. That's the best we can go. We're going to help you with that as we go out and feel some of the water and, and listen to what the district managers from Cal OSHA are telling us so that we can help define this for you. And, and, and that's and that's the big thing because, Michael, we've talked so many times before. I mean, you've got the code yeah. that's written, but sometimes there are things that are vague. And until you see how the inspectors are enforcing it and yes. how the district managers we have no and idea. judges are actually implementing and, and ruling on it, yep. you have no idea. So, um, okay, then let's go ahead and get on to the next one here. Access to shade. Access to shade. Now, the main thing that takes place here that, that is a significant change is the temperature. Yes. Now they, it has been lowered from 85 degrees to 80, which means that 80 degrees shade must be up and present. Yep. Um, your employees have the right, though, to ask to take a break in, to get some rest in the shade, even if it's less than 80 degrees. So you always have to have it available. Right. Thus, you see the pictures where they're, they're not erect here. If you have them at your job sites, you're good. If somebody asks, you can put it up. But when that temperature hits 80 degrees, brother, it better be up. It better be up. And just for the record, if it's below 80, then you have to have it. You just don't have to have it up. So don't think it's 75 or, or I'm in Santa Barbara and I never really get to 80 degrees. I don't really need it. No, you need to make sure that you have shade at different parts of the job site. It makes it harder or worse, but you got to make sure you have that. Now, we were talking about some of the codes and the words that they use and the ridiculousness at times, Michael. Notice at the top there where it says, it used to say shade required to be present. Now it says shade shall be present. Well, Rick, that's a huge switch of terminology. And uh, the great people in Sacramento uh, that pay, were paid thousands of dollars to change that are well worth their money. Let me say that, Rick. Required to and shall are definitely a big difference. I guess they're just trying to lower the words and really hit you with what it shall be. So remember, the word shall is going to be all through this code. They're switching it over because apparently nobody understood what required to was, Rick. Rick, may I go to the next slide? Yes, you may. I have been given permission. I'm moving to the next slide. All right. Access to shade. So access to shade. Now here's another area that a change has been made where you used to be able to have shade up for 25% of your crew that, that was at the job site, right. you now have to have shade for the amount of your crew that would be on a, a break or rest period or even a lunch at the same time. Yep, yep. So if your people all break on the same time or they take a lunch at the same time, you are going to want to be able to have enough shade for them at all times. So agricultural, farming, uh, construction, manufacturing, if they're working outside on a yard, you got to have shade for all of them if they're taking a break at the same time. 
And so, so you may have to work with staggered lunches and, and break periods in order, if, if it's not feasible for you to be able to provide shade for all of them at the same time, but you, you're going to have to work with it. You're either going to have to stagger it to, or, or get more shade so that you have it. And, and again, here's another crazy place where it used to say the shaded area, now it says the shade shall be located. It's huge, huge, right. Remember, shaded area, shade, it's big. Now, when Rick is saying this, we're trying to point out the, the kind of attention to this code that was played so they can switch the detail. This is all about enforcement. This is all about trying not to get you, but to educate and simplify. Some of it we find to be a little bit silly and ridiculous, but the reality of it is this is going to make it easier for them to implement these programs, which for the employer means easier for them to cite you because they're simplifying it, and this makes it even more important to pay attention to. Exactly. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next. I'm um, moving like to that. the next slide. Access to shade again, duration. Yes, we're talking about the duration now. So if an individual employee who takes a preventative cool down rest, he shall be monitored and asked if he or she is experiencing symptoms of heat illness. Right. So anytime one of your employees asks to take one of these rests, you're going to have to make sure that they're okay. You don't just let them go and sit down. Yeah, don't just let them sit down and turn your back to them and hope they survive the 15-minute the break. You've actually got to go to them. How are you doing? The informant or the supervisor must be trained on what the symptoms are so they can watch you. Yes. So it says, and then they, they shall be encouraged to remain in the shade, and they shall not be ordered back to work until any signs or symptoms of heat illness have been abated, but in no event in less than five minutes in addition to the time needed to access the shade. So if you have to walk 10 minutes to get to the shaded area, which I'm hoping the shaded area is closer to that, but let's suggest it's a 10 minute journey to the shaded area. That five minutes doesn't start until they sit down in the shaded area and that's when it starts for that. Exactly. So uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide if you, you want to. Rick. The next one is access to shade, signs of illness, Rick. Signs of illness. So if an employee exhibits signs or reports symptoms of heat illness while taking a preventative cool down rest or during a preventative cool down rest period, yep. which we will address in a little bit there, you'll notice the, the, the sentence it sounds almost like I said it twice, but one said a preventative cool down rest and the other was a preventative cool down rest period, which mm -hmm. actually pertains to a different part of the code, and we'll get to that in a bit, but the employer shall provide the appropriate first aid emergency response according to subsection F. Correct. Now, I know that's a lot of tongue twisters that Rick's got going on there, but the reality of it is when you when you do see that, you've got to make sure that they're getting their, break, their, their breaks and their cool down periods. Exactly. So you want to make sure that your guys are ready to go to take action if, if any of these signs are showing up. And, and down below there, we just put some of the some of the ways to recognize and some of the, the heat illness symptoms that people might have. All right, Michael, go ahead if you will. I'm going to the next slide. The next one, Rick, is high heat procedures, the beginning of high heat procedures. The high heat procedures. So the high heat procedures continue to start at 95 degrees as they have in the past. Uh, but the changes now, it says the employer shall ensure effective employee observation monitoring by implementing one of, or more of the following. A supervisor or designee observation of 20 or fewer employees or mandatory buddy system or regular communication with the sole employee by cellular phone or other device or other effective means of observation. So this is all about observation and watching your people. So you've got to just have one of these done at all times. I am going to recommend that you do A, B, or C. D is going to get real creative. When you start getting into D and you start making up stuff like smoke, smoke signals or tying two cups between a piece of string and hoping it works, this is going to get really, really weird, and this is going to be tough. Let's say you do choose to do the, the, the communications with radio or cellular or phone or something like that, and I am the employee in the field. If you of the foreman do not call me regularly to make sure I am alive and well and not doing it, then the communication isn't effective. And so even C is going to be difficult especially if you have one-man jobs or you have somebody out there. So you got to be, when you're hitting the temperature of Rick, of 95, 95 degrees, degrees. you got to be in constant contact with your people out there to make sure they're awake and alive, even through text messaging or cellular phone or something, so they can text you back and say, yes, I'm awake, I'm okay, and everything's fine. you got to make sure you do something like that. And, and the key here is the with 20 or fewer employees, so if you've got supervisors that have got 
more than 20 employees, you either need more supervisors out there or you got to get the buddy system going, which is probably not a bad idea to, to at least have your employees educated on, on being able to, uh, to determine if somebody's showing some of these symptoms so they can report it at the very least. Having somebody there that's designated with that group of foremen as an assistant maybe for the day to be the person who says, listen, when it's 95 degrees today, why don't you just help me watch the people and stuff like that would be a good thing to get set up prior. Yes, go ahead to the next one. I am going to the next. High heat procedures, pre-shift information rate. So now uh, they've implemented here, it talks about pre-shift meetings before the commencement of work to review the high heat procedures, encourage employees to drink plenty of water, and remind them of their right to take a cool down rest when necessary. Well, they have shaded out a lot of this code in this section and added the blue so you can see that and just know that before you hit your job site, when it's scheduled to be 95 degrees, uh, you are really supposed to have these meetings. There is no signature page required that we can see. There's no call asking for that. But let me say that we do recommend you have some sort of sign-off sheet to say you've been notified of the high heat procedures that we're going to watch today, remind people of drinking water and whatnot with that. you you got to have some sort of daily tailgate lesson, and we do have a lesson on high heat, correct, Rick? Yes, and, and, and you're not necessarily required to do a full-blown No. Scene. Just a quick reminder, hey, no. guys, Make sure you drink plenty of water. It's going to be hot today. You know, the, the, the water coolers are over here, yep. over there. Uh, you know, if, if you have problems, report to Joe or Bob, whatever the case may be, just making sure they know what to do. And, and you, you will be able to have access to our free posters in the webinar that you're going to download that you can use to point out. So the lesson will be there, posters will be there, and like Rick said, it's just a reminder. If you have heat illness, guys, come and see the symptoms. Come and do that, and just a reminder. I agree, Rick. And something I should have mentioned earlier, keep in mind, we're primarily going over the new changes. There, there are other things that obviously are part of the heat illness prevention, and we did a webinar last year. You can, uh, yeah. in your client center, you can can watch last year's uh, broadcast on that. Tip, where we went more into how to how to find, uh, determine heat illness, monitoring the weather, which is part of right. this. You know, right. Your guys got to be monitoring the weather so that you'll know when it's going to be over 95 so that you can have all of this. So it might be a good as a refresher to, for you to, to check back on that as well because we're, we're only really going over the, the changes here. Gotcha. Go ahead, Michael. If you I will. am going to the next slide. The next slide is Rick. High heat procedures. Agriculture. Thank you, Rick. Now this one here, and I'm not going to read all of this, Thank but you, Rick. <laughs> this one here is where the preventative cool down rest period comes into effect. And the difference between the preventative cool down rest and the cool down rest period is that a cool down rest is any time an employee asks to take a break so he can sit in the shade and, and as a preventative measure to, to, to prevent heat illness. Right. The, the, rest, the cool down rest period is actually a mandated requirement here in the agriculture industry. Agricultural only, Rick. Yes. That's right. When it's 95 or degrees or above, you cannot merely just offer no. the, the rest period. They must, every two hours, take a 10-minute, not a five, but a 10-minute period in which they can go sit and, and cool down. Now, this could be in conjunction with their lunches or other breaks that you may be giving them, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll get additional uh, breaks, but it means that every two hours they have to do this. I agree, Rick. Now, you don't have to implement this if... If, say, it doesn't reach 95 until after lunch, none of this comes into play until the last half of the day or whenever that right, happens. Right, right. And the same thing with overtime. At the end of the eighth hour, another 10 minutes, and every two hours thereafter. Bippity boppy boop. Continue on. Emergency here. response procedures, Rick. Okay, so emergency response procedures. Um, ensuring that effective communication by voice, observation, or electronic means is maintained so that the employees at the work site can contact a supervisor, emergency or medical services when necessary, and uh, so a phone or a, a cellular device will work fine provided that you've got reliable communication in the area that you're at. That's right. So you just got to make sure you have communication so that you can call the 911 people to make sure emergency medical services can be provided. So you need to make sure all your folks are trained on what that procedure is and, and, and know how to get that done and, and like we talked about earlier, having other people that can do it besides the supervisor if necessary. Right. 
Next one is emergency response procedures continued, Rick. Yes, it is. So responding to signs of symptoms of possible heat illness um, and, and summonsing emergency services if needed. A uh, supervisor observes or if any employee reports any signs or symptoms of heat illness, they must take immediate action depending on the, you know, that's commensurate with the severity of the illness. So you'll see that these four things on this piece of paper are talking about reporting requirements, right, Rick? When the employee reports, what are you going to do? At what stage do you call 911? When you talk about emergency response procedures, that's what you're really talking about. At what stage are you going to call 911? Does he have to be passed out on the floor, dead? No, hopefully that's not. But you got to make sure that when they get past a certain spot, we're going to call 911, and this is the procedures and how we're going to recognize that and put that into place. Exactly. And so it talks here about if if the if they're exhibiting signs here it talks about you know loss of consciousness, vomiting, and things like that, and the employer must implement uh, those response procedure. In, uh, employee exhibiting signs or symptoms of the heat illness shall be monitored and not left alone or sent home without being offered first aid or having uh, emergency response procedures followed up. On. So there is a base minimum that if your people are vomiting out there that you really got to call 911. But yeah, don't send them home just because they're feeling a little fatigued. We don't want them dying in the car on the way home. Exactly. So you got to monitor and make sure things are good and that you've either gotten first aid or called 911. All right. Okay, let's continue on here. What's your response procedures? 911 call them, Rick. Yes, so contacting them and transporting employees to a place where they can be reached. A lot of times, Michael, these guys work in these remote areas. Yes. And so this is difficult, especially if you're on a job site. Some of these job sites you guys have are so big, you're calling 911, and they're like, well, where are you? And they, they could be unclear on the other side of the job site. So being able to have points where we're going to transport, if it's safe to, Rick, in this kind of a circumstance, it would be safe to transport somebody of heat illness to a certain area where there would be easy access for the 911 response team to get to them on a corner at the front of the job site where the job site's trailer is something that is easily recognizable. That's important. And, and also being able able to communicate, communicate clear directions to, to where you're at so these yeah. people can get to you. Know where you're at. Make sure you know the streets, the closest cross streets and the freeways. I know we get to job sites and we're like this. It's by the McDonald's and you're really you're a half a mile down the road, people. you got to know where you're at in addresses or at least the address next door. Exactly. A climb is a... Oh, a it's always a tongue twister. Thank you, Rick. It's always a tongue twister. A climatization. Thank you, Rick. So here it, it talks about having to observe and monitor your, your employees uh, closely during a heat wave and uh, especially when, when you've got new employees, you know, uh, most people who wind up getting these heat illnesses, it usually happens within the first few days of working in this, in, in this heat. So you really got to keep an eye on these guys. But it says here that uh, for the purposes of this section, a heat wave means any day in which the predicted high temperature will be at least 80 degrees and also at least 10 degrees higher than the average daily temperature for the preceding five days. Now, Rick, I know that's a tongue twister. And when, you, when we first read that together, I was a bit like, what in the world does that mean, Rick? Just quickly tell me what that means in your own words. So basically that, you know, after five days, if it's 85 degrees after after five days, you're starting to get acclimatized right, to it, right. and so now you're not you, you're not having to watch them quite as closely because they're they're getting. But when when you're first getting that burst of that of that heat is when you really got to watch them. Correct, and that's really what you got to do. So after about five days of the being that way, if the degrees are swinging five degrees, that's not a heat wave. But as soon as it swings 10 degrees up one day over what the five-day average has been, that's the problem really what you're looking at. Exactly. And and so then you really got to monitor those guys. And then again, as I mentioned, watching your, your new employees yes. or people who have been, maybe not even a new employee, but somebody who's been reassigned to, to a different area where it's a more strenuous work or he's out in the sun more. Especially employees with hair like that guy in the bottom picture. Let me just tell you, Rick, I haven't had hair like that in years, Rick. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Me and Rick are so bald, it's just ridiculous. Uh, I'm getting hot just looking at that guy with all that curly hair, Rick. If you have hair like that, I, just, I recommend you cut that stuff. It's, it's just too long here, Rick. All right, here we go. We're down to training, Rick. Training. Okay, so as we get into the training requirements included, uh, but not limited, the employer's responsibility to provide water. So that means you've got you to be training your employees and let them know 
that you're going to be providing these things for them. To provide water, shade, cool down rests, access to first aid, as well as the employee's right to exercise, exercise their rights under this standard without retaliation. you got to be able to do this. A lot of you will have job site trailers and then you'll have water and five gallon drums inside, but there's no way for the employees to have access to it. You haven't told them about it. You haven't said this is for them. And so when you, I ask them in the field while we're doing the inspection, where's your water? They give me that look of like a little egg glue that they've got that doesn't have, where do you get that when it empties? And they're just not aware of where they get it, but you have a host of thousands of gallons inside that you just haven't connected the dots for them about. So they, they kind of added a few words in and around some words that already existed when, yep. it, when it talks here about uh, training for acclimatization. Now you have to train them on the concept, the importance, and the methods of acclimatization to make sure that they understand you know, how all of that works and, and what they need to be doing to make sure that they don't suffer heat illness. And to help you with it. that, we have a acclimatization poster. My gosh, I'm getting hard to say that word, Rick. And I also created a lesson on that, so the sign sentence and helping them understand what this means and how to get acclimatized to something out there in the heat. So we have that. We're going to be giving that to you today. Okay. So uh, then as we talk here about the difference as appropriate first aid, emergency response, uh, different types of heat illness, the addition, uh, that the heat illness may process may quickly may progress quickly from yes. mild to serious, and so you got to be training training your employees in, in those things and, as well. And you'll find the lessons that we put together for you, Rick. What are we doing the the download, Rick? Where these wonderful people can slide. We're going to do that in the next we'll few slides. Put, yep, we'll be getting. I don't that want to get too program. eager on that, but you, so. when you see the download, you want to hit that button so you can download this stuff if you're watching this live. If you're watching this live, if you're not watching this live, right? You can still do it if you're if you've registered, right, Rick? And that it, it is going to be sent you a replay. Right? Yes, yes, yes. All right, here we go. Moving to the next one, Rick. Okay, so as we go on here, uh, we're talking about the written programs here. And so now it says here, which you had to before to establish and implement and maintain an effective uh, program. But Correct. now the new twist that they've added to it is, is that it has to be written in English and the language that is understood by the majority of your employees. So as EEAP clients, we have taken all of you guys' heat illness program that we have, that you have access to in your client center. We have updated with all the changes on training issues that we've already gone through. Your programs have already been updated, and they are being dropped as we speak. They should be officially dropped by Friday. My office manager is looking at me. She's getting the finger and saying, yeah, yeah, they better be done. So Lauren McFate's got that going. She will be dropping those by, by Friday. Now, the second spot is the Spanish. Spanish is completed on our set. We have translated your, your heat illness programs into the Espanol. Now, I, I'm not doing any other languages unless you really want to pay me. Uh, what are some of the other languages out there, Rick, that we do come in contact with? Well, I, I hear uh, a big Indian, Punjabi. Punjabi and a couple others that we do. I don't do them. Let me make it clear. But I could translate them if you want to pay. There's just a ton of cash. But I've translated this for you, and the great thing about being an EAP client is I've not just created the customization to your programs and everything that I've updated this, and I've also created all the lessons that work hand in hand with the program that I've written. And so if you're an EAP client, this is going to be seamless for you. From posters to lessons, you don't have to think. If you're not out there buying new updates from some sort of Shanghai a fly by night safety company trying to sell you just a one time pop, we're on it, we're staying on it, making sure we keep your system healthy. Yes, yes. So let's go on here to the to the next, Michael, if you will. All right. Here we go with the safety app. We talked about this in past webinars. Let me just go over this again. The heat illness prevention plan and how it connects to the safe mobile safety app if you're an EAP client is this. Your employees need to have access to the heat illness program all the time. So you've got that huge two and a half, three inch job site book that we can never keep update because there's just so many regulations changing throughout the year. Two, the employees are never organizing it well or keeping it, and they don't even know what it is to begin with. This mobile safety app that you get at no extra charge if you are an EEAP client will not only have all your safety lessons on it that you can do digital sign-off pages with that we've shown you on others, but now you can see the documentation. You just select the documentation, you can go through it, you can scan it by chapter, you can scan it by basically anything. And this will make it so your employees have this in their hand at all times, and then the sign-off sheets with the safety lessons, it'll be systematic. 
If you are not a client of EEAP and you want to know more about this, I have a free demo that we can introduce you to. You just call our office at the number that you got listed below. You ask for the wonderful Therese. She will book an appointment for you to get that free information and everything so you can give it a try. But this mobile safety app for all our current clients is what you need to be able to have your foreman at the very least, if not your employees have access to, to make it easier. And on one note, the usernames and passwords to these are randomly corrected. The, the, the passwords are randomly uh, created. If your password is crazy, just call us in the office. We'll switch it to anything you'd like, and we can make that easier for your people. So don't feel, feel free to do that. Call us in the office, and we'll take care of that for you. All right, I'm moving to the next one. Here are the free posters. Rick, is the download ready? I am trying to get it sent off right now. As Rick is doing that, let me just tell you the idea behind these posters that we've got. We created this poster some time ago. If you do not have this poster up and you don't know what you're doing with this, you really need to get this printed up. You can download it in an 8.5 by 11 format, or you can, you can purchase it for the, for the wonderful $5 and 11 by 17 fully laminated, and I print those in color like that. This talks about what early symptoms are, life-threatening systems, and a gauge where they can see through their urine as long as they're not taking a lot of vitamins and crazy things. This should be able to tell them how, how dehydrated they are. So that's the first poster we're giving you. Second poster is really talking about identifying heat symptoms. Both of these posters are available in English and the great Espanol Spanish. And this poster talks about heat rash, what it is, cramps, uh, all sorts of things that you'll be able to see so that they can get an idea. And when you're doing that high heat standard and talking about that and what they need to do, these are great things to have up at the job site so you can say, look at here, here's this, you can see it and go through that area of it. The next thing that we are doing for you is if you're not an EAP client and you are one of the special few, and I mean few people, that have registered for this webinar that we sent a special invite out to, if you need a free evaluation of your job site, we'll do that at no charge for you, one time free, just to show you where you're up to Kalisha code and where you're not. Everything is fully confidential, and we're interested in making sure we keep everybody up to Kalosha code. Rick, how did the download go, Rick? Well, for some reason, we appear to be having a a download problem. problem here, but no fear, we can fix the problem. We're working on it. We can fix the problem. Now, Lori McFate has come into the great office. She's in here now, and she is uh, going to tell us some questions that have come out. The download is up on the screen. Is that correct, Rick? Yes, it is. It is magically up on the screen. It says PDF file right there. Download now. Uh, feel free this to download them. This is uh, the posters that are in English and Spanish. We put all of the slides. We know there was a lot of content in here. The slides are in there. Um, the posters, yeah, yeah. All, the slides, lessons all of the lessons, English and Spanish, print whatever of it you would like. And uh, also we have available the posters. If you want them in a larger 11 by 17, you can order those on the sticker store. Yeah. All right. Lori McFate the Great. By the way, if you have problems with your service, you're going to want to call Lori McFate. She can take care of everything. Lori, what's the first question that people are asking us today? Does access to our break room inside the building that has AC count as access to shade? Read me the question again. And while she's doing that, Rick, check the questions that are coming live to us right now, Rick. If anybody has questions, feel free to make sure that you are typing those in. Lori and Rick will be looking at that as we answer it. Lori, one more time with that question. Does access to our break room inside the building that has AC count as access? It does. It does as long as it can contain all the employees that would be on break at one time. That is the caveat. And so also is that shade as close as practically possible. That would also be there. And so if, if the break room is so far away from where the guys are working and, you know, a pop-up might be more sufficient, that could be it. But if you're a client of EEAPs, when we do come out there, we would be glad to take a look at that and help you make that judgment call. Because remember, we've seen no citations on this heat illness yet because it hasn't gone into effect. And so as we see this over the next six months, we'll be able to have a better def definition of what we're finding. And we might do an update on this webinar at that point. Lori? Does this only apply to job sites out in the field or outside of the building? Well, it does provide the job sites out in the field and outside the building. But if your building is just death inside. It is incredibly hot and sun isn't the issue, but you have no AC and the temperature inside this area is at 85, 80 degrees, 95. These rules would apply because you, you, we have seen a lab in the past get cited on the old standard. They had very little AC. It was just a lab, people in white coats, and it was hotter than, well, Hades, let's say. 
and they did get sighted. So I'm saying to you, if you've got a factory back there that is hot inside, yeah, you need to have cool down areas for these guys. How does the, this affect general industry, specifically manufacturing? All of our work is done inside, and drinking fountains are available. So the water isn't an issue because you're providing the water to them. But it is key to make sure that when the temperatures in the warehouse are reaching a certain area, now know that this code was built for the simple purpose of, 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 of construction and agricultural. But on the last years that we've seen the heat illness, the old standards, they were applying them to manufacturers too. And like I just talked about the lab, they're suggesting that when the temperatures in these places re reach over 80 degrees, obviously now it's different. You're not providing necessarily shade, but you've got to have a cool down area. So if they're working and they're hot, they're around a melting machine or something, they've got to have a cool down area where these guys can get cool and recover from their heat illness. It's going to apply. So don't think just because they have a name manufacturing directly, it's not going to. These district managers, I promise you, will connect it to you because people have the same threat of dying of heat exhaustion in a warehouse that's 95 degrees. Uh, the next question is, what about a delivery driver making deliveries from an AC vehicle to a remote job site that has temperatures higher than 80 to 95 degrees? He's the only person on site. How is it best to handle this? I would call this man every periodic periodically, and I don't know what periodic means until I see some titations come through. But he has a cool down area. It's the cab of his truck, right? And it's running most of the time. He's making deliveries, and I would imagine in this kind of scenario, he's making short deliveries and he's on to the next. I would say the delivery is 20 to 30 minutes and he's on to the next. I would make sure that this man is trained on drinking plenty of water because a lot of these guys that are drivers, they're rocking it with the monster and the rock stars and the energy drinks, right? And they've got, they're so hyped up on this legal upper that really at the end of the day, they don't realize how dehydrated they are. And I know that the drinking of the water is going to make them urinate more and that's going to be an issue in the delivery, but you got to just make sure they know of the heat illness, what that is, and you, I would call them periodically through the day. How are you doing? What are you doing? Making sure they're okay. The next question is, is it okay to set up a tent over asphalt even though asphalt radiates heat? Well, the whole idea is to have a cool down area, okay? So if the cool down area is hotter than anything else, then you have failed in your cool down area. So I want to say, sure, if you find it to be cool. If it's cool, then let's go for it. But if you don't find it to be cool, then you're, you're kind of screwed. You've got to figure out a cool down method. And remember, the car is not an appropriate cool down method. Unless you plan to keep your car running all day long in case somebody needs to go over there. You've got to find a, a cooler way to keep it. Uh, would agriculture, uh, agriculture would include landscape maintenance services? No. Agriculture is not landscape maintenance services. Agriculture it would be considered under construction and that kind of stuff, job sites and whatnot. You guys aren't picking fruits, vegetables, and storing them. You're, you're, you're cutting lawn, doing pipes and flowers and doing that. You're, you're part of the construction world, so you wouldn't have to do that extra step in the agriculture, but uh, you'd be considered under that. And that's where, let me just say, the mobile app is going to be is going to be the key for you. This is going to be a key for you on the mobile app. Your guys out in the field need to be doing a safety lesson or a tailgate lesson every 10 business days, and I don't know how you ever get that done without our mobile app. That is actually no charge to you guys if you're an EAP client, if I may plug that. But the reality of it is you've got to call, get a username and password so that you can do this and, and use this uh, mobile website. It, it's going to change the way you guys collect your stuff. Lori, are you done with your questions? Yeah, that's all that I can see. Rick, what there. else you got? Okay, here it says, uh, one of the new regulations is to provide mobile crews with detailed map to provide directions to emergency response services. Do we consider our on-site staff who works in the field as a mobile crew? Yes, your people on-site that work on-site are mobile. Why? Because they're, they're, they're really just on the job site. They're, they're away from the head office. But in case... In, uh, the way I'm interpreting this is, say you're working at a, a farm that has a physical address, and he's out, in, you know, in the yard behind there working. He's outside the heat, but but I wouldn't think that, that they're going to require to have a map. And I mean, they they've got a business address that they can for uh, calling for help. The, the key aspect with this in the question is wherever your employees are and they need help, they need to know what's going on. So I'm, I'm suggesting this. 
if you have a warehouse, it's easy to do. We know where the address is. We're there every day. But if your people leave the warehouse to work on a job site where they are a mobile crew that uh, fixes plumbing every, you know, a four, a, a three uh, and a half hour to an hour plumbing fix at a job site, or they're a gardener cutting lawns for 20 minutes, they need to know where they're at. They need to be able to make sure that in the event of emergency, they can clearly say, I am on Hollywood and Vine. I am at Fifth and, 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 and Linfield. They need to be able to say, I am here at all times. So you want to provide a map form? Great. You want, to, you want to make sure they know the area? Great. But you've got to have a way where these guys never say the words, I have no idea where the hell I'm at and I need help. That is your problem that you need to overcome in a nutshell. Okay, here. Um, someone's asking about the mobile website slash app. And if you can maybe explain a little right. bit about the issues that are happening. Yes, I can, Chris. Here's the deal. The mobile app itself is an app in the, in the sense that uh, well, it's a mobile website. The app is coming in that. I know I keep saying the word app, and that might be a mistake on my part, but it will work like a mobile app and everything like that. My team is about to finish up. We've had some delays with going back and forth with Apple, but we're hoping to get it submitted by the end of the week, if not next, so that we can get approval on that, that it could be on iTunes. Right now, the mobile website's address is... Is e -E -A -P dot Mobi. Now, if you go to YouTube, we have a whole uh, video channel, eeap.com, eeap, the safety people, and that will be there and it'll show you. But it's eeap.mobi, which is the mobile website. But if you're having a hard time finding it all together, I'll make it easy for you. Call us in the office. Ask for, uh, if you're a client of EEAP, the first person answers the phone, just ask them for the mobile website address and your, and your password, it'll lock you in. If you're not a client of EEAP, you just call the office and ask for Therese. She will set up a time to give you that demo so that you can have that and try that. And we have a new special going on with that that we can tell you at it. We can quote you over the phone that I think you'll appreciate. Okay, here it says, uh, Tim's asking, if the foreman had the safety app, would he still need a hard copy of the IIPP on the job site? He would not need a hard copy of the IIPP on the job site. Now, I have sat with the district managers in California individually, asked them these questions. There is no requirement that says it has to be in printed form. The requirement is they have to have access to it. So your employees must have access to it. So as the foreman, if you're coming and leaving the job site, then, then, that, then you got to have a way to stick there. But most of the foremen kept the job site binders in their trucks, and they took it with them anyways. So to have you have the mobile the website and the one of your employees is the best option so that everybody has access to this, and we can open it up, look at it, and it's, and it's great. It will really save you a lot of time and update. Next here, uh, question doesn't look thoroughly complete, but it just says, what about residential floor installers? I guess he wants to know if they fall under these under these regulations? A, a residential floor installer still has to apply to the heat program because of the heat. Remember, it's not a percentage of how much sun is coming on you. Nowhere in the code did it ever say, if you are, are hit with 50% of sun through the day, you need to apply. It's about temperature. And so if you're installing floors in areas where the heat standard really is very low because of the AC and you're in AC areas, this might not be an issue that you really have to do. You will have to fulfill the requirement of teaching about the heat illness. You will have to fulfill the requirement with when it regards to uh, having the program in place because you're in construction and all construction is mandated to have it. But this isn't something that you're going to do a lot of, uh, you're going to have a lot of problems with on implementation. It's, it's simpler. It's a lot simpler for you to implement. Okay, uh, one of the questions, somebody was saying that the download didn't work, but uh, when you click the download button, it actually opens up in another tab so that we don't lose you here on the webinar. So Correct. if you look at the top there, you should be able to, after the webinar, it will still be there, and you can click on that and then download it. Okay, next question. It says, we may have missed it, but the gallons of EE get changes. How many gallons of water does every employee need? Rick? Uh, that, stay, that stays the same. Stay the same. It's, uh, what is it, basically two gallons a day, a two, quart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, quart per hour, is Yeah, it? yeah, two gallons per day per water per employee that they need to have access to. That is what it is. That didn't change from last year. I, I, they didn't really need more and less just didn't seem intelligent, so they left it alone. Okay. Um, do you have the posters in Spanish? Yes, the posters are available in Spanish. Yes, we got them for you. They should be in the download. If you have problems with the download, call the office. We will send you the download. My phones are probably ringing off the hook by okay. even saying that. Okay, one of the, okay, we already did that one. Um, please explain in conjunction with the luncheon break. 
So I, I, I guess they're they're talking about with the e either uh, providing you know, access for for their guys or also if, in taking their breaks if in the conjunction. If their standard break is falling at the time period where they need that the that every two hours comes into play, then then you don't need to create a new break for that. It will be it, it can be assumed to be the same. This isn't a new break. It's just that if your take starting them at eight o'clock and they're not breaking until noon. You you got to throw in there under the agricultural rule. You got to throw in that every ten minutes every two hours. If your construction or or anything else, the reality of it is there isn't a standard of how often. But but the reality of it is you've got to make sure that they have opportunities to take the breaks, right, Rick? Yes, and and, and then also in with regards to providing the shade again. Uh, even if you stagger your breaks, but if everyone goes to lunch, then you would have to have enough shade for for all the folks that are at lunch at the same time. Um, Let's see here. Let's go on. Do we do that one? Yeah, we already did that. Uh, well, let me tell you, we're getting a lot of questions, and we really appreciate that. And uh, keeping these things going is always is always good. Um, is, is there a is there a time period? Is there a tie t i e period? Is there a time period? A time period with regarding to what is the hard one, Rick, to know, uh, so we don't know how to answer that one. Just keep it going. Laura, are you looking at the questions, too? Yeah. Um, you're you, down to the ones that I asked you. Okay. okay. Uh, how, right. Did we ask about how it affects general industry? Yes. That's almost. Okay. All right. I think we've answered all the questions. Laura, are you doing a quick look on that yeah. to make sure we did so we don't keep everybody forever and a day? Uh, we just want to tell you that we know that you, that, that, that we, we know that you have business that you can choose where to go. We want to say thank you for everything that you do. Uh, we are here to serve you and take care of what you need. Our mobile website and app is coming. It, it is just an easier way for the employees to get access to it. We know that. We're working on that. Please be a user. If you're an EEAP client, you get this at no extra charge. This is part of it. This will help you immensely. All the signatures will be saved on your client center. They'll be stored there forever for, for, for the three to four year period that is required. And this way, all your employees have access to it and you can print them up. This really is the future of safety in California. There is no way with the amount of rules and regulations that change that you will be able to keep up to code with everything without somebody in your corner updating, researching, watching, and putting this into place for you and making sure you're good to go. I know your teams out there are quite capable and wonderful, and we're just looking to assist them in this. Please uh, please contact us for any help that you may need. Rick, do you have anything else, sir? Well, um, there, there's more questions popping in here, but like you said, in, in the interest of, of time, we've already been uh, going for 45 minutes here. Um, probably ought to go ahead and, and cut it at this point, but I will look at the questions here and see if I can respond to those that sent them uh, via private message. That All right. sounds appropriate. That does. Me. They will respond to you. Rick will be able to respond to you and answer your questions on that, and thank you very much. We're doing another webinar in the beginning of June. Please be ready to uh, be part of that so we can get more education on what we're doing. We'll give you any updates on then when it comes to the heat illness. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.